so Allison asked me to talk about priorities in addressing AI risk. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to just mention I work at the Partnership on AI. Uh, it's an independent nonprofit, uh, but created by the tech companies, and we have an uh, order of 100 partner organizations. This talk, importantly, does not represent the views of necessarily of PEI and definitely not of our partner organizations. Take these as individual views. So thinking about AI risk, there are different ways of slicing things. Short versus long term is a familiar frame. Technical problems versus problems within particular institutions versus large scale problems problems in our culture, politics, or economics. And then the difference between accidents or local unintended consequences, uh, malicious uses or misguided uses, and then large-scale cross interactions between uh, uh, systematic effects that people couldn't have anticipated or can't control. Thinking about the short versus long-term distinction, there are many similarities. Both of these uh, sets of problems can involve misspecified objectives, corruptible objectives, uh, side effects from the thing you're trying to do, uh, having the wrong incentives, whether at an institutional level uh, or at an individual level. The short-term problems are interesting, not just because they're serious and urgent, and many of them are, but also because they're practice. Uh, since we're at a foresight event, they're practice for, for longer-term, larger-scale problems. And if you're more of a short-termist or more of a here-and-now person, uh, you should really put value, nonetheless, on accurate foresight, because that's going to let people plan ahead better uh, and mitigate problems down the road. So our advice is work on both. We're trying to work on both. Uh, some examples of the short-term problems that are really high stakes from AI right now include premature deployments of machine learning in, in high-risk or high-stakes settings where the technology isn't ready. Um, the use of uh, recommender banded algorithms, whether for advertising or social media, that we're seeing having uh, a potentially destabilizing effect on politics uh, or on psychology. Uh, and problematic labor and economic consequences from really fast deployments of new technology. To take one of those examples in detail, uh, in the state of California, uh, last year a bill was passed mandating that every county in the state should purchase and use machine learning or algorithmic risk assessment tools to decide whether to detain or release every single criminal defendant prior to trial. Um, and this is in the context of uh, mass incarceration in the United States, which is truly an enormous problem. And reformers here were really trying to get the United States back in line with other countries and with, with historical norms, uh, reduce incarceration by moving from a punitive system to one that's more based on evidence. Uh, and so what they were doing is collecting survey data about people's lives, their criminal histories, their circumstances, and then trying to predict, oh, will you uh, re-offend if you're released prior to your trial, or will you fail to appear for a court date? Um, and this, these decisions in California will affect 63,000 people per night. Uh, across the United States, it's closer to a, a half a million. Um, now, it turns out there are some serious problems with these systems that are being deployed, though they may be well-intentioned. Uh, one problem that's been flagged very loudly is that uh, sometimes it seems the uh, African-American defendants get high-risk scores in ways that don't make sense in comparison to their uh, Caucasian uh, comparators. And in fact, if you look statistically, you see that the false positive rate, the odds of being labeled as dangerous, given that you're not dangerous, almost twice as high uh, if you're African-American than if you're white. So this is a very serious problem. Our PEI has been working on mitigations, uh, including a report that we produced with all our partner organizations with 10 recommendations of things you'd need to fix in the statistics and machine learning uh, and institutional setting if it were ever to be appropriate to do this kind of deployment. Uh, efforts on transparency so the institutions building and, uh, and purchasing, procuring these technologies can understand serious problems like the fact that they're trained on 10 and 20 year old data that includes, for instance, marijuana arrests in a state like California where marijuana possession is no longer a crime. So predicting uh, reoffense based on that is very problematic. And then larger scale mitigations that are not specifically about this criminal justice problem, but about the field as a whole, uh, the use of documentation and transparency uh, through a project called About ML that ha should help the AI community tackle similar questions wherever they arise in the AI industry. So this is a project being led by Jingying Yang, who's uh, uh, here today. Um, and it is trying to gather initiatives across lots of different organizations to produce documentation and transparency about the way the pipeline, the way that uh, a machine learning project goes from specification to data set to model to deployment, and 
get people to pause and ask themselves the right questions about failure modes along the way. So uh, looking at this, this uh, particular problem, it's short term, it's about local unintended consequences, but there are mitigations in all of these categories. I'm going to move to something longer term, uh, value alignment. In this community, you'll often hear people talking about uh, paper clipping, or instru instrumental convergence. And I want to provoke a little bit on this topic. You know, paper clipping is really a new version of the old story of the Midas touch. You wish for everything to turn to gold, and then you realize that wasn't quite what you wanted. Um, I've got another frame that might be interesting to explore here, which is that uh, paper clipping is actually related to totalitarianism. Uh, we have a, a real world problem we, we're familiar with that we're restating. Uh, in futurology terms. So I have this conjecture here, totalitarian convergence, uh, this, that powerful agents will, with mathematically certain monotonically increasing open-ended objective functions will adopt sub-goals to disable or disempower uh, other agents if their obj objectives do not exactly align. You can prove this. I'm going to skip the proof. Uh, it's a, an economic style proof with some simple stylized assumptions. Um, but what you get is that an agent starts off by disempowering things that disagree with it altogether, and then it's left with its sort of allies that somewhat correlate with it. But if there are constrained resources, it may want to get rid of them as well, in order to, or their agency at least, in order to get the perfect optimized world. Uh, this turns out to be behavior that's observed in human political systems. Totalitarian and authoritarian regimes often ally with other, uh, other perspectives and movements in order to gain power. And then once they're in positions of power, uh, regimes like Cuba's or, or the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany suddenly turn around and exile or imprison or purge uh, their former allies. And so paper clipping, in, in some sense, may be a story, a warning about totalitarianism, a problem that humanity has already struggled with at enormous scale. And there are some corollaries uh, that come out of this. One is don't build high-stakes AI systems with single specific optimization objectives. Being too sure of knowing what the right thing to do is is dangerous. The second is that there's a research program on how to specify objective functions that involve preserving or optimizing for others' agency. This is actually a very subtle and difficult point. It's kind of like figuring out liberalism, Western liberalism or libertarianism, if that's your thing, for your objective function. You're going to need, instead of having a specific goal, to have a region that you tolerate in some way and a mathematical specification for that. There are numerous technical value alignment problems that come along the way in figuring out the shape of that tolerated or, or good region as a function of others' preferences. So moving on from, from that cluster of problems, there, there's a question about how we build a stronger field and realign the many institutions that are working on AI in a way that reduces risk. One idea here is to build safety, fairness, and social good goals into the benchmarks, data sets, reinforcement learning environments that so many AI researchers use as the yardstick of their field. We're doing a little of this work directly at PEI. Uh, Carol Wainwright, who's here today, uh, has a project called Safe Life that's building uh, a test environment for reinforcement learning agents to teach them to avoid side effects. It's built on Conway's Game of Life, uh, giving it the name. Um, you can ask him about that, and we could even do a breakout session on it. But there's also a possibility of doing something larger and more structural inspired by the same idea. Could we build uh, a compendium of missing data sets and machine learning infrastructure, basically a platform, a gathering place for the whole field to come together and say, I've got a, a missing ethics or social good problem over here. Who has the missing pieces or the team or the funding to close that gap? So as I close, um, you know, thinking back high level, what should our priorities be on AI risk? There are some articulated here, but we shouldn't be trying to set them all ourselves. We should be building cultures, fields, feedback mechanisms, and institutional capacity to gather all the solutions to these problems uh, so that we aren't just one actor charting one course that turns out to not quite be the right one. Lastly, before I finish, I also want to uh, do a quick pitch for tomorrow. Rosie Campbell at PEI is running a session on publication norms. And B. Cavello is also here and a great person to talk to about AI ethics implementation within large organizations uh, and labor and economic impacts. Uh, thanks, everyone. OK, great. Stay right there.
Awesome. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Peter. I will give it first up to uh, Robin and Jillian uh, to kind of pester you with questions while I ask the ones that have questions in the audience to move up front to the mic or to find Aaron and give you your anonymous question. I guess he'll still come out there. So, Peter, when you say we should be doing this, who's the we? Uh, there's probably a different way for each of the uh, places I use that phrase. In some cases, I think it's a community that's trying to do planning and forethought on AI risk. And that's a, a fairly large and growing community. So it includes uh, people in this room, people working at AI labs, academics who have a, a perspective on these questions and things to bring civil society organizations. And maybe in some, in some cases, I'm using the aspirational way for the partnership on AI and its many partner organizations trying to, to, to gather resources to tackle these questions. Maybe there are some places where there is government as well, though I, I, I was less thinking in those terms. So one of the traditional ways to deal with uh, totalitarianism in government is limited power. So in the context of AI, that's sort of looking at how do we limit the set of actions they could take? Is that also an area that seems fruitful? It's a very good idea, but I think the thing that has made people nervous about that approach on its own is that um, making those limits robust with rapidly improving systems is hard. And so, you, you know, as a computer security person, I'd say, well, you want defense in depth. So you want both some limitations placed there, but you also want a system that if it accidentally, you know, finds an exploit for the limitations, um, doesn't do things that you'd regret afterwards. Okay, sweet. I have an anonymous question here. Uh, is PAI comfortable on exporting AI to China? <laughs> I don't think that export is the right frame. Uh, if you look at AI research and look at the literature, uh, it is being written by a, an academic research community, a scholarly community that's global in nature. A huge fraction of the authors uh, on those papers are of Chinese descent. Many of them are Chinese Americans living in the United States, coming to grad programs in the United States and wanting to stay. And so uh, in general, it feels as though the frame of global co cooperation is, is probably the right one uh, for where does AI come from? and the framework of collaboration on safety and allowing that, you know, if you want to play strategic interest, the United States probably would serve its strategic interest by creating new visa categories um, that allow people to, to stay and work in the United States. And PEI actually has a, a report with some recommendations on that front. I think in the uh, AGI um, great powers meeting that we had last year, there was also one of the recommendations that came out of there. Um, and I think there's a little bit more on kind of like how we can bridge uh, bridge, that, uh, bridge that gap. So if you're interested in the report, it's, uh, it's lying out downstairs. Um, okay, and um, just to maybe give you, uh, give a little bit of context on the prediction that you made. Um, it's not on Metaculus yet. Uh, it will be, uh, I think, uh, by tomorrow, hopefully. Um, but in the prediction, you're saying, um, your field is the, the, we're on a good trajectory if a new norm against single value optimization has successfully altered some high stakes ML deployments by governments or tech companies. Do you want to say like a few sentences about that uh, so people can, can get predicting tomorrow? So I'll give a couple of examples of where this goes wrong. Uh, so one of our partners uh, had a paper that they showed us uh, with a medical prediction system that was recommending outpatient interventions for people released with cardiac conditions. To, uh, and what they were optimizing for was the hospital's uh, financial incentives. Under the Affordable Care Act, there was a penalty for the hospital if they released someone who was readmitted within 30 days. So they try to predict um, whether uh, this intervention could help prevent uh, that readmission within that window. But you could easily see that there are other pretty relevant objectives, like maybe the overall welfare of the patient uh, on its own was one, um, where you'd go for a different decision, or you might slide the window and say, well, 30 days might not be the right time horizon. You might want uncertainty about what the correct time horizon is. And so in a case like that, you probably shouldn't be using one objective function. You should be uncertain over an ensemble of them. We see the same thing with these criminal justice prediction algorithms. There's a lot of debate on what the right fairness correction methods might be for the false positive rate problem that I showed a slide on. There's a literature with lots of arguments about different correction algorithms. Uh, and no one's doing anything right now because there's no consensus. There are, in fact, impossibility theorems saying that none of the, the corrections are the perfect right correction. Instead, perhaps what you could do is be uncertain about which is the right form of fairness. And then that leads to systems that sometimes say, oh, wait, like maybe we should 
release this person or maybe we shouldn't and here are the kinds of considerations that lead to that. And so what I guess I'm hoping is that we'll start to see that philosophical concern taken back into engineering and preventing the deployment of overly confident systems. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter.